Hi there, welcome to AP Environmental Science Chapter section, chapter 17, lecture video number three. Let's begin. Well, you were talking about air pollution and things enter the atmosphere, they enter the air, and then some things stay in the air a different amount of time. We would call that the residence time of a particular chemical or a molecule or a pollutant. Short residence times means that it doesn't travel that far, so it generally affects things not very far away from its source. Long residence times, those can end up in far places. So this goes to our next concept, the grasshopper effect or global distillation effect. I believe we've spoken about in the past, but let's bring it up again. What happens? Um, pollutants end up evaporating where it's warmer, lower latitudes towards the equator where farming is taking place, things like pesticides, for example, and if they have a decent resonance time, they end up drifting north and more north until they condense and fall to the earth. This can keep happening, and that's why they call it a grasshopper effect, where things are jumping around the earth. Short resonance times doesn't travel as far. Long resonance time travels much farther, so things will evaporate and condense and fall in other regions. This is why we find pollutants all over um, Alaska, for example, and these are like pesticide pollutants, and they're not even doing farming in these regions of the world. Clean Air Act, it was passed in 63, amended in 70, and 90, probably needs to be amended some more. Um, what is it all about? Well, we want to make sure that emissions, things when people are burning things like car emissions, standards for automobiles are met. Um, emissions from factories, things of that sort. Um, basically, the whole idea is to monitor, keep an eye on what is in the air and how the air is changing. This is what the Clean Air Act was really about. Let's see what's in the air, how are we changing it, and how bad for us it is. It Now, carbon monoxide is one of the first um, type that the EPA measures. There are six emissions um, that are measured by the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay. A major, these are major ones I'm talking about. Carbon monoxide, well, it forms when things are burned. When things are burned, and they say incomplete, not total combustion, it doesn't burn completely correct, instead of CO2 forming, CO, carbon monoxide may form. Um, common is from car engines. Um, there's a lot of, there's deaths every year as a result of carbon monoxide inhalation. Sometimes people will have something, for example, in a snowy climate, their car would be, buried under snow and their tailpipe is plugged by snow and then they get in their car and they fire up their car to heat up their car and then the the exhaust fumes end up billowing back into the vehicle and then they can get carbon monoxide poisoning what happens they generally die if they don't get treated fast enough carbon monoxide prevents blood from carrying oxygen so the hemoglobin the protein in your blood does not like oxygen as much as it likes carbon monoxide it would stick to carbon monoxide more easier than it would stick to oxygen. So therefore, hemoglobin has a higher affinity to carbon monoxide. So you end up suffocating due to lack of oxygen. Even if there's oxygen in the room, your body holds on to the carbon monoxide before the oxygen. Um, how is it released? I don't know. Other than burning and vehicles, certain industrial processes, burning of waste, any burning of any sort isn't always perfect. Sometimes people have issues with their heaters in their homes, an old heater. You can have carbon monoxide poisoning. You're supposed to, by law, have a carbon monoxide sensor in your house. It is a silent death. There's no scent. There's no odor. And you would probably pass out due to lack of oxygen. Nitrogen oxide is another one that's followed and maintained and kept an eye on by the EPA. These are very reactive molecules. Here are the three different kinds that you're talking about. Nitric oxides, nitrogen dioxide, and nitrous oxides. These are very reactive chemicals, and they react in different ways. They lead to a lot of harmful substances. Um, what happens? Well, they're generally in that reddish-brown color, and these are involved in smog, which is brown smog, basically. They're part of the reason why smog has that brown smog has that color. How do they form? Well, when we burn things again. Engines. Well, there's about 78% of the air naturally is nitrogen. About 21% of our air is, is oxygen. So 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. The rest is carbon dioxide and all the other gases combined. So less than 1% is CO2. But you're talking 78% nitrogen, 
21% oxygen. Well, these things, when you start burning an engine, reactions take place. The heat, and there's oxygen in the air and nitrogen in the air. Well, reactions take place. So whenever we burn something, nitrogen in the air and oxygen in the air, they form nitrogen oxides. And these nitrogen oxides now are in the atmosphere. They react in the atmosphere. What do they contribute to? Well, they're part of the reason we have smog. They react with water and they make nitric acid. So when they're released, their primary pollutants, when they react and form smog or acid rain, um, then they are secondary pollutants. Some of these contribute to the destruction. Some of these at ground level, nitrogen oxides don't destroy ozone because we're worried about ozone that's in the stratosphere. So when they rise in elevation, they react with ozone and they can destroy ozone, leading to less ozone in the air. But they are not the reason ozone is being depleted on our planet. They are not the primary reason of ozone depletion. So don't assume nitrogen oxides are the primary cause for ozone depletion. They are not the primary cause of ozone depletion. Um, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Well, I always, if you were in my class, I'd be telling you right now that perfumes and scented items, a lot of those things are releasing organic compounds that are volatile, highly reactive. So highly reactive organic compounds, not very good for us, generally speaking. Highly reactive, they can lead to a lot of problems. Ha um, the humans, we're the major reason of these VOCs. Where do they come from? I don't know, different sprays, fumigants, different plastics because they're made out of these chemicals, gasoline scents, paints and their odors, different pollutants made in factories. I already said you perfumes at your house, different chemicals you use at your house, nail polish remover, you name it. These are volatile organic compounds, all right? They react very readily and form a whole bunch of pollutants. VOCs are also part of the and with nitrogen oxides and VOCs that lead to smog, okay? And the term off-gas is when things just release gases slowly, like plastics around us in our house could be off-gassing VOCs slowly into the air, and we're inhaling them, and then they're reacting within our tissue. Particulate matter, these are solid materials that enter the air. Common sources during a volcanic eruption or when you burn matter and it becomes these little dust particles and you get all this soot in the air. Um, when they are released, for example, dust and soot, they're primary. When they react and form other things, then they're, they're, that's when they are secondary pollutants. Right? Particulate matter, what do they do? Well, you inhale these little solid, tiny microscopic objects and they damage lung tissue they can travel in the wind they can travel far distances they're usually named after the size of their particles and their particles have to do with micrometers or microns is what we call them so for example a pm particulate matter of 10 means it's 10 microns in diameter if it's 2.5 it's 2.5 microns in diameter this is a human hair and that's 50 to 7 microns in diameter okay and showing you one, two, three, four, five of these P10s will get across a human hair. And then you need one, two, three, four of these P, P2.5s to get by one PM to 10, excuse me, one particular matter of 10 microns. And it's just giving you an idea. This is beach sand right here. So showing you how small this stuff is. It's not big. That's why it travels and hangs out in the air for a while. It's very light, very small, and it can start hanging out in the air. Lead is another uh, pollutant that EPA keeps an eye on. Where does lead a lot of times come from? Pipes and metals that we have used, old homes, old, old water lines, copper pipes that are lined with lead soldering, different things of that sort. A lot of pipes and water, lead in the water. A lot of it comes from old, old plumbing and old piping. It's a problem. These are metals. Metals damage nervous system. So they create major problems or neurotoxins, basically. And by the way, lead has lead um, pollution has gone down over time, specifically because you don't remember, but when I was maybe a little kid in the 70s, they allowed um, lead based fuels to be burned. And now gas is always unleaded because they removed the lead. They realized how bad of a thing it was for the environment. So gas is specifically unleaded. Different parts of the world, though, they don't have unleaded gas necessarily. They might still be using gas with lead or it wasn't it wasn't purified as much as it should have been. So what can people or places do to get rid of some of these pollutants we just talked about? Well, air scrubbers are a common one, okay? What does that mean? 
Um, well, this is called a wet air scrubber. What happens is you're burning all these things, all the soot and all these coal, for example, and then these these parts, these matter, this air, these gases start to rise. So what this is a wet one where they spray it down with a liquid, and that liquid has other things in it that will now react with the components of the gas that you're trying to capture. So for example, they try to capture sulfur that's released from burning a coal because the sulfur leads to sulfuric acid, which leads to acid rain. So the whole goal is to see if they can catch it before it leaves. So they have to get the gas particles to react. It doesn't capture all of it, but it, it, it can do a, a decent job, but not everybody is, is using air scrubbers, basically in their smokestacks. Oh, here's a picture of it again. Oh, this is a duplicate of the last one. So this is a duplicate by accident. Don't worry about this. Same information here on the bottom as you saw here. All right, let's go to this page. Catalytic con converters. Our cars have these things called catalytic converters. All right, so what happens? Pollutes from the engine. They flow through this converter. All right, so carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, different things flow into your catalytic converter. What's in the catalytic converter? Uh, this honeycomb meshing it has metals that are um, suspended within this metal, with, within this meshing, excuse me, and these metals can catalyze or help almost like enzymes. They can help uh, trigger reactions. And the reactions they're trying to trigger are reactions that are going to slowly reduce the numbers of these things. So you don't want nitrogen oxides entering the air. You're better off with nitrogen entering the air and oxygen instead. All right. Nitrogen is already 78% of the air. Oxygen is already 21% of the air. Those aren't really bad for the environment because they're already there. But nitrogen, the different nitrogen oxides are. Carbon monoxide can get converted with the help of oxygen into CO2. Okay. CO2, not, not as bad for you as carbon monoxide. Um, hydrocarbons can also be turned into CO2 and water and different things of that sort. So what they're doing is there's metals that are located in this meshing framework these metals trigger or catalyze reactions, and then you end up with less harmful stuff that's released on the back end of your catalytic converter. Criteria pollutants. Well, there's some major pollutants, six of them that are kept in eye. They're called the criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, which I just talked about, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter we talked about, lead we talked about, nitrogen oxides we talked about, and tropospheric ozone, which is ozone at the ground level. Tropospheric ozone, let's talk about this one now. Well, ozone in the stratosphere is good. Ozone in the troposphere, bad. Also called ground level ozone, bad. You do not want to be inhaling this. How does it form? Well, these nitrogen oxides and these VOCs we've talked about, they, it, with help of sunlight, they react. They trigger reactions that create ozone. Ozone don't ask me how or where, but I remember as a kid, I was at somebody's shop, like a mechanic shop. They had some type of tool and it created ozone as a byproduct. And I remember as a kid smelling it and it was a distinct odor. I can't even describe the odor of it. I shouldn't have been smelling. It was probably super awful for me. Okay. It can damage living tissue. It's very, it, it's very oxidative. It can cause reactions in your body. I should have been inhaled, but I remember it had a distinct Odor, and I can't even describe the odor of ozone, but it has an odor that I will never forget. Um, it's it's colorless for the most part. Oh, the odor is strong. Um, it's one of the main components of smog, which forms. Okay. I believe we're going to stop there at ozone. We're done for the day.